Uh, so I'll just give you a background. Uh, I didn't go to John Abbott College. I went to Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as long as Grandma's around, I felt protected. No matter what, if Grandma's here, even if a bull came charging, she'll grab that bull and slam it down. <laughs> that was. Sorry, don't happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one time we were picking berries in, way in the mountains. And, uh, and a farmer's guy, that's where blackberry growing and blueberries go, growing over there. And we go picking. And that farmer had a big bull in there. And we didn't, we didn't know, we knew he had cows, but we didn't know he had a bull. And then my grandmother never wore a man's slacks in her life. I never seen her wear man's slacks. She always got a long dress on, my grandma. We're picking berries over there, and I don't know how old my grandma was that time. She had to be in the late 50s or maybe 60s somewhere that time. All of a sudden, that big bull come charging, <laughs> and she hollered, and we all run to the fence, get under the fence, and we dive under the fence. Uh, grandma can't get under the fence, so she's too big. And I, I seen her take a leap right over the fence, <laughs> dress and all. <laughs> And I said, holy, that must be Superman's wife. I couldn't, I couldn't. She had lots of power when that bull chasing her. And then while we're talking about that, uh, I, I moved back to the original homeland of the Mohawks. Before Ganawaga, before Akwazosni, we came from the Mohawk Valley between Albany, New York, and uh, Utica. That's the, the whole valley there is our homeland. And uh, we had to run away because European came there and they want the land. So that's why we're in Ganawaga, we're in Akwazosni, we're in Hamilton, we're all over the place now. But anyway, um, <laughs> now in back in the Mohawk Valley, we were there in 93, we went back there. And that land where we were was actually where my grandmother's grandmother had her village there. And, and my family didn't leave the Mohawk Valley until 1833, 80, 1832, and uh, she, they had a house in Amsterdam, my, my great-grandmother, and the railroad went through there, right through her house, but she had two houses, one in uh, St. Regis Island and one in, over there in Amsterdam, New York, because they were basket makers, and that's why they go back and forth all the time. So, uh, so the railroad went right through her house. In those days, if you're an Indian, there's no conversation, nothing. You just, okay. you just don't okay. care. You just lose. So that's when my family left the Mohawk Valley in 1833, I think it was, and went back to Akwazosli and stayed there. And uh, the, but uh, when we went back in '93, there was a, a Cayuga man from Six Nation, older man. He's passed away now. His name was Ron Styers. He belonged to the Wolf Clan. And he spoke fluent Cayuga. And he could understand Mohawk too when we talk. And he came to live with us in 93. He lived with us all the time. He's the one who had cut the grass and helped with haying and uh, trim the grapes or trim the peach trees or whatever we have. Because he grew up on Niagara Falls in the fruit farms. So he knows all that. So he was sitting on a porch. And this is a new land we got. Man. It's an old Mohawk land, but it's new for us. He said, and this woman came from Washington, D.C. And uh, she says, uh, uh, I, I'm from the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and I heard you Mohawks uh, purchase a land over here. And um, I'm from the Bureau of Indian Affairs. I come to see what, what are you doing? Because we're not on reservation. And uh, she says, so I'm going to walk the land to look at it and do a report. And she, she says, I'm going to go over there in the pasture up there in the woods like that, up on the hill sort of. And, and Ron says, oh, ma'am, I don't think you should do that. Oh, no, he says, and she pulled out a badge. You see this badge, it's a federal badge from the Bureau of the Department of Interior. I can go anywhere, so nobody stop me. 
Well, he said, I told you, I should, you shouldn't do that. He says, no, nope. you see this batch, I go anywhere. Okay, <laughs> so she went up there. A little while later, she was screaming her head, a bloody head off, <laughs> running faster than a bullet. And she's hollering, help, help, help. The big bull is chasing her. <laughs> Ron yelled, just show him your badge. <laughs> Yeah, those bulls, can they don't care. <laughs> you got badger or not, they're going to get you. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I thought I'd share that with you. And then uh, I, I have, uh, I was going to tell you too a little bit, most important one. Uh, so I'm not going to be in chronological order. I'm going to pull from what I think is important. Um, about, now I don't know if you're going to believe this or not either. But uh, it's up to you, uh, completely. Uh, five years ago, uh, there was a big meeting in uh, Toronto. It was a world conference of uh, leaders of environment at the CN Tower. And I don't want to, they invite me to go there. And I don't want to go there because I, I don't have no degree or d master's degree, nothing to be an environment scientist person. And a world scientists are going to go there with degrees and doctorate degrees. And, and I don't feel like comfortable to be with them because I never went to the school like that. But then uh, from Montana, Eric Noyce, um, he, he called me up and he says, I sent you uh, gas money to go to that meeting. I think it's important you go there. And then another lady called me up and she says, uh, I, I rented a hotel room in Toronto for you. I want you to go to that meeting. And I don't really want to go, but these people want me to go, pushing me to go. So they look in the mail, there was money from Eric Noyce to go there. So I feel bad if I don't go now. So I jump in my car, the same one I'm riding to get here. And I go on a throughway. Because uh, uh, Mohawk Valley is uh, one hour west of Albany. And I got on a throughway, and I tell you this, whenever I go somewhere long ways in my car, I always go alone. Uh, and I put the country music on the radio, George Jones and Kitty Wells. <laughs> and then when I go, go far away to Buffalo, four hour drive, I get to Buffalo like that because Kitty Wells and George Jones were singing. <laughs> and I didn't even notice how long the road was. They're my helpers, them guys. They're all kind of way passed away now, though. Mm -hmm. and, but anyway, we passed Syracuse on a throughway. And I'm listening to the radio. And then we got towards Rochester, New York. And you know how when you're traveling, sometimes the radio will fade away? in another station, and it came fighting like. But I heard a lady talking on there, and this lady was talking in the Mohawk language. And I said, no, it can't be, because there's no Mohawk lives around Rochester that has a radio station. You gotta go to Gatnawagi, or you gotta go to Akwesasne, or you gotta go to Six Nation. They got radio station, and you can hear Mohawk woman or man talking there on Mohawk language. But not in Rochester. So I shut the radio off. And I, but that lady kept talking. It wasn't the radio. It was coming through the air. Coming through the air. And she's talking Mohawk. And I'm going to share with you what she said. She said, the reason how come I come to see you because you don't want to go to that meeting in Toronto. You don't want to go there, but you're going there. And when you get over to that meeting, you tell them that I came to see you. And then she start talking. She said, almost all the people in the world, all my children, pretty all of them, forgot that I am their mother. 
I am the mother earth, she said. And I'm the mother of every living things. People, animal, bird, grass. I'm the mother. And almost every one of my kids forgot me. Didn't care about me. And she wanted to cry. I could tell she wants to cry. So you tell them when you get to Toronto. What well, I come to see you. And then when you tell them too, there are two times in the year, in springtime and also in the fall, when the day is the same length of time as the night. That's the same. I didn't really know about that part. I never studied that, that one, until she told me that. I thought she was talking about December 21st. That's what I know. Because midwinters, we go by that too. It wasn't that though. So mother told me that after. And she says, on that day, I want you, if you are, and the way Mohawk says, the way she said Mohawk, that's what she said. That means if you are willing. She didn't say I have to do it. She didn't threaten me. She did just like my grandmother always told me when we're going to go to a ceremony at Longhouse. If you want to go with me, she never said I had to, but I was her tail. And this Mohawk lady came through the air, said the same thing. If you are willing, you tell them. On that day, when the day and night is the same length of time, twice a year, I want you and your wife to invite your kids and your grandkids to come to your house, or you can go to their house. And when before the sun shines, only the dawn, the sun didn't show yet, you make a fire and you burn tobacco for me, creator, in all life. When, just before the sun shine, only the dawn. When you finish that, you cook big food. All your kids and grandkids are going to eat together. And then when you finish eating, I want you to sit down with all your kids and grandkids and great grandkids. And she says, explain it to them. How come I'm their mother? Because I'm lonesome for them. When you finish telling everything you know, why she's our mother? You can get a canoe and go on the Mohawk River with your kids paddle. Or you can take the trails that goes in the mountain behind the barn with your kids. Or you can ride a bicycle, you and your kids around. And then she says to me, and I know you got a great big John Deere tractor in your barn, you like to ride it. If you're willing, don't ride it today, that day. Anything that's got motor or use of gas or something, don't do it. Don't use it. Use your feet and paddle all day. Be with your family and explain to them. And then when the sun is ready to go down, before it goes down beyond the horizon, you make a fire again or you can use a pipe. Means you burn tobacco again for me and Creator in our life. And I will be so happy. I will visit my kids again and they will visit me too. And that's what I tell you to tell them at that big meeting in Toronto. That was five years ago. And I've been doing that every fall now and every every uh, springtime 
And I tell you the same thing too, what I told him in Toronto, give you the message. But that means only if you are willing, you can do it too, to re reconnect with the Mother Earth. Those two days, honor her. Visit her. So she won't be lonesome. And you won't too. But don't, when I tell you this, it's not, I don't bend your arm and say you got to do it. I don't say you're going to go to hell if you don't. I don't, I don't have nothing to say for you to be afraid. Only if you want to, then you walk to your mother. And you honor your mother for our kids' sake. And that's the extent of that message that came five years ago. And I give it to you. So now I'm going to change another one. But that I thought was important. And the next one I was going to tell you is that <clears throat> when I was a little boy, because this girl right here in our longhouse, I used to hear my relatives, or old ones, there were the speakers there. They used to say, <clears throat> someday it's going to come when our children, our grandchildren, they're going to talk and the whole world's going to listen to them. I used to hear them say that. And I, even when I was a kid, I go like this. I don't believe them. <laughs> Because nobody likes the Indians. The people in Fort Messina, they don't like us. Oh, they'll say hi and everything. But that's as far as that goes. And they ask Grandpa to work on their farm as far as that goes. That kind of relation. But there's no like family, like kin kinship. There isn't. Nobody wants to listen to us because they say we don't know nothing. So when I heard my leader say that as a little kid, I shook my head. And I, I think they're just dreaming. If, so, if someday our grow, grandkids grow up, that we're not going to listen to them because they don't, they don't think we're real. They don't think we're real human. Well, I got news for you. <laughs> I grew up. <laughs> and um, my cousins and different leaders we have, were invited to go to Switzerland to the United Nations and their talk and the world listen over there several times. And they go to New York City, United Nations, their talk again. So it came true what I thought would never I'd never would see. And so on that basis, <clears throat> my uncle, one of my uncles said when I was a teenager, and the reason I know this is because uh, myself and others my age, I was their leader. I used to gather all the young girls and boys that was around my age, a little older than I was. Let's go see Uncle in the St. Regis Village. And we go there early in the evening. We make coffee or tea, sit at the kitchen table. And all night he's talking, all night. Pretty soon now, sun is coming up, we go home. Many nights that happen, and he's teaching us about our ceremonies. He's teaching us about great law. He's teaching us about our clans and how that works. And I'm ever so grateful to him because he took the time to take our ceremony apart and explain each detail where does it fit and why does it work? He really took the time. Whereas most of the time, our longhouse, we know what to do there because we go there all of, every year since we're kids. We know everything what to do, but we don't know why we're doing it. It was never, they never tell us that much until my uncles do that to us. I was so happy. And that's how come, because I know everything what he told us, my uncle, that's why I never touch alcohol. All my other friends is use alcohol and do parties when I'm a teenager. Now me, because uncle told me we're not supposed to do that. 
and we belong to the medicine society. So you're not supposed to be under the influence of anything because if somebody gets sick during the night in the emergency, you've got to be a medicine. You've got to go there, perform for the sick people. You never know when they're going to get sick. So don't touch alcohol and contaminate yourself. Make yourself pure all the time. So you're always ready to help your people. <clears throat> anyway, he said to me to, at the beginning of the world, <clears throat> now for those of who here are academic scholars in history, maybe you can verify or just there, or what do you call it, opposite, uh, and say it's not true. <laughs> Here's what he said. At the beginning of the world, when all humans were first made, when the world was new, when he made black people, and he made white people, and he made Indian people, and he made Asian people, He gave us all ceremony, same thing. He gave us all the original universal truth to all of us. And everyone, black, yellow, red, white race, at the beginning of the world is a matrilineal. Everybody, not just the Iroquois. Everyone, white man, black man, was all matrilineal at the beginning of time. But over years, men in different parts of the world began to push the woman aside and take over. And then next year, he pushed the woman aside more and he took over more. So pretty soon, then uncle says, and my great grandfather said, my grandma's uncle said to me, in 1754, he said our great-grandfather went to Skanehtadi, that means Albany. And they invited to go there by Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson to recite the great law of peace because they were astounded how does these people called the Haudenosaunee, the Haudenosaunee people, how, how do they unite it together and they can't do it? They have been to fight against England, I guess, or whatever, around that time sometime. So they invite our great grandpa to go there to recite the law so they might get an idea how to make a government without a king and a queen. And again, I didn't believe my great grandpa. Because the Mohawk school I went to in Hogansburg said, don't listen to your old people and your grandma and grandpa. They never went to school. So whatever they're talking about is undocumented. It's all fairy tales, like Cinderella and the Seven Dwarfs story. And I'm a kid, and they told me not to listen. It's don't take credit in there, what they're saying is not credit creditable not documented. So as I was a kid going to school, and then when I go home, whatever grandma and grandpa and uncle says, I was told not to believe them. Yet they're my grandpa, they're my uncle. Then when I'm home, they told me to go to school, don't listen too much to them, they're gonna brainwash you. <laughs> so I always felt, I was, I was growing up like a tennis ball getting shot from one side to the other. Never had my feet land on the ground. But because of my uncle, even though I got confused, I never touched the drugs or marijuana. I never touched the alcohol because of my uncle. That was great. I'm still grateful. But he's dead now, long ago. But anyways, so... When great-grandfather was talking about 17, and he used to say, he don't know how to say that, 1754, because he was an old, old man. He says that like this, 1754. <laughs> That's how he said it, 1754. Mm. 
And, uh, and I didn't know the difference. So when I was telling people, I was just like him, 1754. <laughs> I thought, that's how you're supposed to say it. <laughs> I didn't learn until later. That he, 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 I don't know what was wrong. Something wrong with his tongue, or he don't know how to really talk, I guess, English. <laughs> but anyway, and um, he says, uh, so then in 1968, in 1968, we had a group called the White Roots of Peace. We traveled the whole Canada, the whole United States, every reservation, every urban center, Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco. And we delivered a message, what we can, in 68. We got to Albany, New York, and Albany somehow contacted our schedule guy for our group. And he says, we invite you to come to Education Building in Albany, the old education building. We went in there. There was 12 or 13 of us, mostly all young guys. This is in 68. I had hair. <laughs> I didn't have a belly. I looked like a broomstick. That's all right. You're a good man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. So when we went to the education building, he says, I want to take you upstairs. He took us upstairs. On the wall, biggest the screen, there was a painting of Indian guys. And sitting there was Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson. It was a painting on the wall, as big as that screen, or maybe bigger. And that Indian guys had a wampum belt on their sh just like my great master explained it, touched the ground on the floor. He was telling about our constitution to Benjamin Thomas. And at the bottom under here was a gold, said 1754. I put your diet. <laughs> I, I felt validated. How dare I uh, not believe my grandpa? Now we got documentation. I felt like an eagle. I could fly in the sky. I was so proud about my grandpa and my grandma. They were telling the truth. The school was lying. That thing was t taken out of this education building. You know where they took it? To the State Museum in Albany. It's there now. I've never seen it there. I want to go see it, though, because those guys were my father's direct great-great-grandfathers explaining the law. But as they were talking, Benjamin was writing down what they're talking about. And my nephew said he made a T-shirt of my grandfather's wampum belt talking 1754 on a T-shirt. And Benjamin's sitting there. And when he said, the Haudenosaunee Constitution is dominated by women, matrilineal, women are the ones who choose which men, they initiate the choosing of which man is going to be a political leader and which man is going to be a spiritual leader. It comes from the woman. Men has input, but it's initiated by woman. And then it has to go to the process, to the young, to the kids. Even kids are going to have a say. And that's how you make leaders according to our Constitution. So that's what he said. But when my nephew made T-shirt, when they talked about the woman initiating the process of our leaders in government, Benjamin just crossed it out. He said, no, not that one. We can't take that one. This was 1754. It wasn't until 1924 that Congress finally passed a law just to give American white woman a voice to vote. How long was that took from 1754 until 
1924. My mother was a little girl when that happened. So things are changing. They are catching up. But there's not just that they omitted when they listened to Benjamin. They're really in trouble now. Do you hear them, the Congress, how they're talking? Do you hear how Mr. Trump's talking? If women were the boss, they'd be out a long time ago. Probably three quarters of Congress. Because in our Constitution, it says any man who does not tell the truth and lies is not eligible to be leader. Any man who disrespects physically or, uh, what do you call it, uh, emotionally, disrespect a woman can never become a leader. And what did Mr. Trump do? I would have thought right there, he's done. But they know they're still praising him. Even women are, something's wrong. But anyways, and so now, uh, here it is. So I'm going to now close that part, okay? Because you need a whole bunch of time to go from A to Z if we're going to do it properly. So that when we're done, you land on your feet and you feel like a big bull. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you're sure of yourself. And that's what we're not sure of anymore. So back now to the, uh, to the beginning. So they say, and this is symbolic language, that our great, great, great grandma came from another planet in the solar system. This is our actual story. And her was uh, come over here to this Earth planet. They come through the sun, through the Milky Way, and come here. And that's why when we die, that's what they say. Uh, the sun come after us. Our older brother's son will come after us and hold us and take us back through the sun and through the Milky Way back to Galunhiaki, where our great, great, great grandma came from originally. But our physical body will be reclaimed by this planet's Earth. But the other part goes back. And so when she came here, she was pregnant. That takes about three or four hours to tell the story there. But well, we don't have that, so we're going to readers digest it. <laughs> and so she, she got here, she, nine months, baby come out, a daughter. Then the daughter grew up fast, grandma raised her up. And no woman can have a baby unless there's a man, <laughs> right? You don't need John, uh, John this uh, school's. Uh, certification for that. <laughs> you don't even have to go to kindergarten. You still know how. <laughs> Boy, that man laughs and he smiles. He likes that. <laughs> but anyway, so guess what? So she raised her daughter. And one time, and so then the earth was a turtle. And she danced. This is her Erica, who didn't show any people. They dance like this all the time. This way. I think they call it counterclockwise. That's the way that grandma danced on a turtle. And the magic happened. It grew big to become the earth. And then while she grew up, her daughter and the turtle, big now, big land, the continent, was one, one land too. There wasn't an Asia. And there wasn't an Africa, there wasn't a Europe, it was all one land. So the daughter is now a young woman, and she said to her mother, Istan, how big is this land, this turtle? And she told her daughter, well, just walk that way, just keep walking, you'll come to the big water, and that's, you see, if you go the other way, the other big water, then you'll see yourself how big it is. 
some of my old people said she walked three days at that time because the world was new. And when she came back, all of a sudden a big wind came from the west and it found her walking and that big wind impregnated her and she became pregnant from the west wind. That's how come Lakotas, Mohawks, Choctaw, Seminole, all our spiritual ceremony life were related to the wind. We related to the Mother Earth. We related to the thunder. We called them Grandpa Thunder. The rivers is our uncles and cousins. The moon is our grandma. Everything like that. So that's how come when tornado comes or hurricane comes, my grandma and even I'm married to a Choctaw from Mississippi, when tornado hurricane come, you know what they do? You know what my grandma do? She goes out there with a sacred tobacco and she faces that big wind or, or if it's a tornado and she talked to them. Sometimes she took an ax and put it there or a knife and stuck it in the ground. And she says, and she give it tobacco, and she talked to them. This is where we live, where your grandchildren talking to the wind. And that wind was split because of the ax or that knife. And where we live, it goes around or it goes over. And when it gets over, it comes down and we're okay. And our house is, was little shacks. <laughs> It won't take nothing to burn, knock it down. Americans got brick buildings, some tear their house all to pieces, and they just live a little ways away because they don't talk to the wind. They're not hooked to the creation. They've lost communication. I know this because I've seen it all my life. And I've got six kids, and I've got a whole bunch of grandkids and great-grandkids. So I do what my grandmother did. But she's gone 50 years ago now, so I took her place. That's why I came here, to share with you that. So anyway, uh, then the girl got pregnant from West Wind, and she had twins. They call it Dehnikon. Dehnikon, Hadinaglat. They were born, the twins. And that twins, one became the day, and one became the night. One became the, the birth, and one became the death. One became the happiness and the laughter, and the other one was the grief and the tears. And so my uncle, when he explained it to us, said, you, you, me, our kids, the trees, the cow, the pigs, the rabbits, the squirrel, are all made of night and a day, negative and a positive in our body. So when our young, when they're teenagers, the negative darkness takes over. A lot of times we don't think both stories of the night and the day, and we get in trouble easy because we're teenager, girl and boy. But then grandma said and uncle said, so when your kids, grandkids act up and don't listen, they're being influenced by the negative that's in their body. That has to breathe too. So instead of reprimanding them, that's the time when you go see your grandkids or, and their nephews that's acting up when you hold them and you hug them and put it back to positive so they'll be balanced. You don't throw them in a jail. You don't hang them on a tree because they're in balance. You gotta get them back balance through our ceremonies. It's pretty nice, the way they think. So anyway, back now. So they created, they make creation. So here's what my uncle from the village said. So they took, here's what they said now. <laughs> they used the power of this earth I don't know what you call it, that power of the earth, but it belongs to this earth, the whole earth. And they took the power from Galunhiagi, where grandma came from, because she carried that here. 
and then it become combined with the power of Earth, this planet. There's a two. And then they took the dirt. And then they took the water. And then they took the air. That's where they say our father is the wind of the West. And they put them together. And the two twins, they don't have no pattern really. So he look at his brother to make the dirt and the mud and the fire, everything together. Put the legs on and foot, foot and fingers and toes. He was the pattern, the other brother. Then the other brother became the model, and the other brother did the same. And he made human, and they followed the grandma, how to make the woman. And then they said, in the way Uncle said, "Na esigo hawi wasigo dastanyo, konungwe no kniyoni ro nungwe wasigo dastanyo, John Jade." That means they made the man and they made the woman from those things I just told you. But they were like zombies. They blew in their mouth three times and they used fire too to make them live. And when they blew in their mouth three times, their eyes began to blink and they had mobility. They could walk, but they were zombies. They can't think yet. You know that like when you buy a CD or a cassette tape, but there's nothing on it until you sing or talk and then and you record something. Well, that's the way we were, like a new cassette or a new CD. Nothing's in here yet. We got the brain, but nothing on it. So when creation stood there, Jini ho ni gong hlo da sang gwa di sang. Ne wa sogo ni gong hlo da. Now they will know how to live on this earth. I instruct them. So he transfer his knowledge to their head. And that's what our ceremony says that we do in our longhouses. When little babies are born, there's a ceremony to welcome them and to instruct them how to live and their relationship to the sacred universe we live in. So when big thunder comes, we have thunder dances. When everything happened, we always got a ceremony for it. And the thing that grandma told me, listen around, don't follow the American people too close. Or you're going to get trouble. I, when I was young, I don't know what that really means. But then what she said, <laughs> uh, when it rains, don't never say like the American people says, oh, what a miserable, lousy day it is because it rained, ruined my day. Whoever heard anybody to say that? Creator sent a water so the strawberries will grow and get sweet. Creator put a water, sent it, rain. So the river and creeks will be fresh water for us and the animals and the birds. Never complain when it rains. Creator give you that to make fresh. In the summertime when there's no rain and dry up and it's really hot, Americans always say, oh damn it's so hot. Don't do it like that, don't copy them. I always say what a beautiful sunny day because it got so cold in winter, it's like a gift. Nice warm, so the corn will grow and the trees will grow and our little kids will grow. And I'm gonna tell you another thing Grandma told me. This is kind of funny, but it's not funny. I was telling them guys at the room we were at a while ago before coming here. One time I had to go to a meeting on a dog and it was foggy, you couldn't even see this far in the front of you. And Anandaga from Akusasti is about three and a half, four hours, if the road is clear. And I said to my grandma, I said, oh, it's, you saw Danyatste. It's foggy, you can't hardly see. She says, you better stop talking like that right now. And I said, well, how come? She says, well, when it's foggy out, that means our Creator and Mother Earth are married together 
and they're having intimacy. Don't bother them. <laughs> and, and because when it's like that, everything's going to be born again. And that's the creator of Mother Earth. Make a baby get born all of, of all species. Isn't that really so, something wonderful to think like that? So now, when I don't care how much fog it gets, I just stand back and say, go to it. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie Pan teach me that. <laughs> no. But those are all the little teachings that our elders tell us all the time. And as a parent, as a father and a mother, and now my grandpa, and now my great grandfather, it's my duty and my wife's duty to tell all my kids the same and to tell all my grandkids the same and my great grandkids. So when they grow up, they will be balanced. They will be kind. They will respect the world they live in. And I think, I think somebody moving around, that an hour went by. But I want to say to you that I come here today with the invitation to share with you some of the teaching and the worldview of the native people. And maybe someday, it has to be pretty soon, that uh, maybe this kind of teaching, what John Abbott wants to do, begin, can be in every university, in every country of the world, to put us back on the spiritual path, the universal truth, so the water won't be polluted anymore, so the air will not be polluted anymore, so our children will not be polluted, but they will have a chance, the seventh generation, when they're born, the way we did, the way our grandma and grandpa gave us a chance to live. So with that, I say thank you for being so nice and kind to listen to me, whom I thought would, nobody would ever listen to the Indian, but you listen so good, thank you. <laughs> so maybe we'll have some questions. Yeah. yeah. I, I definitely have a question. If anyone else wants to ask any questions. Um, I guess what you ignited a spark that lit up the room for me when you said that. And in a way, um, everybody in the whole, whole world, remember a while ago I alluded to it when my uncle talked about it, that we were all given the same understanding of how we're supposed to live. Well, all the people in the world has been colonized. The Indian, native indigenous people have only been colonized for three to four hundred years only. But European people have been colonized for two and three thousand years. It's still in the DNA of the blood. And likewise in other parts of the world, they were colonized at a certain time too, but way before us, the native here in North America. My suggestion for all people is to re-indigenize the white, the Chinese, the black, re go back to those original teachings and you'll find it's the same as mine. And so what, what my uncle said, our job, because our colonization is only 300 years, in the, in the last 200 years, that's when it really uh, got destroyed is still in our DNA, but close to the surface. And it's because we still have our ceremony, because we hit, so they won't stop us. We have to share and, and shine a light so that others can find their indigenous root and what it looks like so they can identify it. And so I, 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 had, I did have a book called, uh, and Grandma said, that everybody, it's on the third edition right now, and a lot of this stuff of, of how to think for kids and how to raise your kids is in there, because it's, 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 it's writing of what I've heard over the many years. And so that's a beginning, you could follow that too. So as long as you have this world view and the earth is your mother, then you will begin to dream 
then you will begin to establish relationships that's unique to you and your mother and all the other sacred things. And those answers will come to you. And each one will experience those same things. So it's a search of everybody has to do that. And the quicker we can do it, the more chance our seventh generation to be born will have a life to year in this earth. I don't know if that's a sufficient answer. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, while I, I was in, me and my son went to Germany two years ago. And when we were in Germany, we, we went north, south, crisscross, sideways, backwards, everywhere on the trains. We were, I was there for seven weeks, and this was in June. And when I was over there, the Germans had strawberries that were ripening all over. So I said to those Germans, do you, do you have a strawberry ceremony over here? It went way over their head. They didn't even know exactly nothing what I'm talking about. And I said, we do have ceremony for strawberry. Senecas, Ondagas, everybody's got strawberry ceremony, indigenous people. And you used to have it long ago, but I don't know how many, 2,000 years ago since you did your last one. Well, while I'm here, uh, go pick strawberries and we're going to have a strawberry ceremony. <laughs> I'm going to show you how we do it. And you don't have to do it word for word or exactly the way I'm doing it, but it gives you an idea. Come up with your own way how to say thank you to the strawberry. And if you want to sing, ask the spiritual world that you might dream a song that's befitting to honor the strawberry and it will be yours. It won't be a Mohawks or a Seneca. Although we, f we show you the road, now you, now you plug in how to make it real. And so the same thing with sun dances, moon dances and all that. You can do that too, but you've got to find your own, your own connection so it's going to be real. And we can help you like on those to how, to, how to recognize it. Mm -hmm. But the only thing in the Indian country, real Indian country, we don't have no such thing as a hell. There's not, no teaching of hell or a devil in our teachings. We only got that two brothers, negative and positive, but they're in both of us, and so we have to honor both of them. We don't make a demon out of one or the other. It's a balancing act until we die. See, right now, the, the Iroquois Confederacy, uh, it, like if I were to say, get a piece of paper, and I, 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 I tear the paper up in a thousand pieces, and then I took the thousand and throw it, so it scatters everywhere. That's what residential school, Canada and America did to us with the Carlisle School and the residential school era, and that's what missionaries did to us too, because they forbid our way of thinking. So our confederacy, including myself, us, us we are living today, we're, we're, we're just picking up pieces here and there all over, trying to put it back together. Because we're all product. Our grandpa was going to those Carlisle School and Mohawk School in Brentford and all over, Spanish school. And so we're, uh, we're not functioning at full capacity because we're, we're in the mode of trying to gather and look for those pieces. And they threw them so far away that we could never do it again. But, but we're resilient, I guess you'd call. So sometimes we're magical because we find those pieces and we know where to put it. For, we've got enough yet to do that. We've got enough glue to do it. And so um, uh, I got a communique from Germany from Klaus Biegert. And he asked, he wants to know, can the Confederacy Grand Council uh, ponder or entertain the idea of sending a delegation from the Haudenosaunee Confederacy Grand Council uh, to send it to Russia and to Ukraine and also to Israel and to Palestine to show them and to tell them about the peacemaker, what Charlie's talking about. So there is a letter now received 
But like I said, we are wounded. We're trying to get better so that we can do that. I don't know if we got enough to do it yet or not, but it, but it certainly should be worth a try. And it may even mean that if whatever delegation goes there may get shot or imprisoned too, but that's, that's the way the price one has to pay for such good things to come. But uh, no, that's, that's a true. We have to re-educate. And it's not just native. Whoever still follows indigenous, whether they be Asian, whether they be Africa, together to, to do it, because it's the same teaching, really. It's the same relationship as well. And uh, my, my uncle used to say, uh, this is another uncle. He, he passed away when he was 100 years, almost 100 years old. Uh, about probably 12 years ago now. He says that um, in Europe and all the, over the world, there were indigenous people, men and women, and, and they used to be women in it all the time. But like I said, when these establishments came of king and queen, dictators and emperors, now it's hardly no more king, queen, now they're corpor corporation uh, executives that are the new kings and queens doing the same thing. So they try to kill all the traditional people who have the universal truth. And for Europe, the most example of that is Joan of Arc. They burn her to the stake and accuse her of being a witch. And in my own community, that's what they call us too. The ones that were, well, the other way, they call us witchcraft. And, and they weren't too kind to us either. <laughs> but that's changing now too. They're starting to understand that that's not true. Just like when I said I, I seen that thing at the education building, I was so, like I got born again because my story and my grandpa's story is not a lie. It's really true. And so that's what I encourage everybody. Let's, let's start on that road of truth. Let's use the eyes the Creator gave us to see what's real. Let's use these ears to hear the birds sing and what things are really true sounds, not f fake sounds. And give us the ability to see that and jointly together. And in our constitution of the old Iroquois, everything, it says, until we come of one mind, that's what it calls for, that we become of one mind. So if there's a dissension, <coughs> there's a conflict, we got to work on how to make it come one mind. It, it won't work until it becomes one mind. Because if you become one mind, you don't need an army. You don't need a policeman to enforce it. You don't need courts because everybody's got a good mind and have a one mind to follow the good things. <coughs> I, I had one question. I have a burning fascination with the, the cane that you brought. Uh, I don't even know if that's what it's called, but could, could, could you talk about it a bit? It's a question they're going to talk to. <laughs> Can you give it to me? Yeah, you know, <laughs> I asked him if he can do it, and he says, uh, you do it, you talk more, you know it more. He says, well, I, and if I do it, he's going to talk all day. <laughs> but anyway, this is called a condolence cane. And this, uh, this particular cane was belonged to my grandmother, the one I'm always talking about. And she died about maybe 50, almost 50 years ago, maybe. Maybe more than that. And on the 10th day from her death, we have a giveaway feast. And uh, so she told everybody in my family to give it to me, her cane. And that's how come I have it. And um, so this cane my uncle talked about, the uncle had said we stay all night all the time. He said, when it's standing like this, it's the white pine tree, the white, great white pine tree, 
which was the tree chosen to represent peace in the world. And when you look at the white pine tree, the needles, so there are five of them with a black a brown thing at the top. And, they, and, and uh, my uncles used to say that brown one holding the five needles is the creator. And also the wampum that they use in the Grand Council is patterned after that. Is a leather of a deer skin holding it together. All the, in each strand represents a nation of the original five nation. Oh, well, now it's six. But, so when it's standing like this, it represents the tree of peace. And it's so tall symbolically and so great. It's a symbol. That's why it's so great that it pierces the sky, the top. And at the bottom is there four white roots, one to the east, north, west, and south. And it's white, so that it means peace. White represents peace. So people who are worn are not comfortable and have turmoil and thoughts of war. They can follow the route to the source and become like in peace, like the rest of us are. And that's why it's white roots. And that's why when we used to travel, remember a while ago I told you, with white roots of peace, that's what we called our group, because we were spreading that word. And then at the top of the tree is the eagle, because eagle flies the highest, and the eagle it will be the guardian bird or the chief of all birds, it will warn us if something comes to the tree uh, to hurt the people taking shelter in the shade of the branches of the tree of peace, the eagle will scream. Is that like the beak, in a way? Right here. All oh, right. There, there is a face yeah, of an eagle. Yeah, 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 the face of an eagle. And uh, so that's a symbolic. Then, if you put it, which way is east? Because in this room. East uh, would be that way. That way? Yeah. So there's east and west, north and south. So we'd hold it this way. So this way here is the east and the west, north, and south. So here, like this, then it becomes the big lawn house. The lawn house. It follows the sun. So that's why when you recite, my uncle used to tell me, all, he used to be very particular. He says, when you talk about the Iroquois Confederacy, don't mix up, he says, always follow the sun. Geographically, the way the sun goes, it starts in the east. So the Mohawk is first. Then the next group is the Oneidas. And as the sun goes, Undagas. Then as the next sun goes, Cayugas. And the sun goes the west is Seneca. He says, that's Ganusisk, when it's like this, the longhouse, where the nation lives symbolically. He's, and he says, and the floor of our lawn house, because it's so big, is the Mother Earth. And the roof of our lawn house is the sky. And the door is where the sun comes up in the east. And where the sun goes down, that's the western door. That's how big our lawn house is. And so you see in here, these pegs represents each leader of the Mohawk clan. So the first is three of them, and another three, another three. So that's a, it's a, over here there's a bears and a turtles and a wolf. And the bears got three kind of bear, and the turtles got three kind of turtles, snapper turtle, mud turtle, box turtle. And uh, wolf, same thing, three kind of wolves. There's a gray wolf and a coyote wolf and a white wolf. And then when you go past there, here's a, Oneidas here, there's nine leaders there, and they follow clan too. Then when you get in the middle, that's where the fire is of the Great Council. That's in Onondaga, Syracuse, New York. And they have 14 leaders. They're the smallest by far of po in population of any of the Iroquois nations, but they have more leaders, almost double than the rest of us. And the question sometimes people raise is, how come they're the smallest and they got the most leaders? Because when we counsel, um, we have to be unanimous decision, all one mind. 
So it doesn't matter if you've got ten or one. If that one don't agree, it can't go through. So it doesn't matter if they got more or not. Because it, it doesn't matter at all. So then when you go further to the Cayugas, they have ten leaders. And then the Sanakas is uh, right here, eight leaders. And the leaders, they call it in our language, Luyane. Luyane. And that word means he's nice. He's good or he's nice. That's what he interprets into English. So it's, it's, uh, it's considered disrespectful, really, to the older Indian people when you say chief. Because when you say chief, it has a connotation of the buck ends here, or the fire chief, or whatever, you know. And that has nothing to do with our law, that kind of thinking. Uh, Luyana means a, a man, if it's a woman, a clan mother, we call it Yaguyane, she who is good, she who is nice. And that's the leader, that's what we call it. And so um, if it's all of them, Ludiane son, all of them men are who good, are good. That's what we call it. Our good is son, mean all of the women leader that's good. Yeah. And the reason, and so in this law, women initiate which men will f hold these positions. And uh, it's understood by, by our older people that when babies are born, the creator already chose which baby is going to be the chief. Even before they're born, they already did it. Creator already did it. And so he gives them the natural ability in their blood, in their DNA, to do that. So the clan mothers and the women and the people has to follow how are they going to recognize which baby has that gift. So a clan mother can't, when the chief die, they pull this out because each one is a leader. So when he dies, they pull it out. So then they have to put another leader in, and they put it back. That's why they call it condolence, to, to condole the dead and then to raise a new one, see? So all your missing ones are ones that are? The, the ones that are missing <coughs> is because I'm traveling on the road too much. Ah, ah okay. <laughs> and they fall out, and right. I don't have time to put it back. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> So, uh, but uh, you but know, in the old days, maybe. Yeah, yeah, no, it would be it would be correct, but this could it fall out. You know, it's old now too, and um, so though, so that chief, uh, so when babies are born, they say that uh, a baby come out of the mother, you wipe their nostril, and, they, and as soon as they breathe, already the creator at their birth has predestined their death. So. As soon as you're born and you breathe, it's already marked how long you're going to live, how many days. And that's why they said we can't change that. Unless you use a gun and shoot somebody in war, then, then you push the creator aside. You say, get out of here. I'm taking over this world. Mm. You see? Mm. Uh, same thing with uh, if suicide happens. Uh, we discourage suicide to happen because you're pushing again creator because he's the one who made your date and you're pushing him away. And so well, my uncle, I asked my uncle about that too, about suicide stuff. He says, when, when uh, he says, our spirit is like a feather of an eagle. When, when you take the down of a feather, eagle's feather down, the downy part, and you let go, it won't f go right to the ground. It goes like this, little breeze, it take it this way. But, but if you die naturally, the way you were born and destined that birth, your death, then your spirit don't do like that feather. The sun come after you, takes you, so you won't get lost, and you don't afraid. You're not afraid. But if you some commit suicide, you're you're like the down feather. It, it doesn't find that road to go direct. The sun can't take you right away, because you push the creator aside. That means you push the sun aside.